Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for coming. My name is Angela Evans, and I'm the dean of the LBJ School uh, Public Affairs right next door. And on behalf of the entire LBJ community, the LBJ Presidential Library, and the LBJ Foundation, uh, it's my distinct privilege to open up this program this evening uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary it's a key milestone. You know, you don't hit 50 very often. Uh, and this very, very important report. Uh, and this report, of course, had its origins in, in the 1967 race riots. Uh, I want to express a special ap appreciation to Dr. Eric Tang. He was just, there he is over here. Raise your hand. And also, um, He's at the UT Social Justice Institute. He has elevated this. He got it going. He was the energy behind it and got a lot of people together. And he's the reason why we're having this this evening. <clears throat> I also want to have a special thank you, a big shout out to the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement here at UT, the Moody College of Communication School of Journalism, as well as radio and television, the Department of African and African Diaspora Studies, and the Center for Race and Democracy, our own Vanille Joseph. The Kerner Commission report came out at a time of reckoning for the country. The civil rights movement had lifted the promise of African American equality and forced white America to come to terms with this toxic racial history. In the summer of 1967, race riots erupted in more than 100 cities across the country. In Detroit, 43 people died in what was one of the most violent and destructive riots in US history. It was this summer of turmoil that led President Lyndon Johnson to assemble the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, which came to be known by its chair, Illinois Governor Otto Kerner. The goal of the commission was to answer three questions. What happened? Why did it happen? And how can we prevent it from happening again? So three simple questions, very complicated um, charge. Upon establishing the commission, President Lyndon Johnson said to its members, and I quote, let your search be free, let it be untrammeled by what has been called the conventional wisdom, and as best you can, find the truth, the whole truth, in your report. The commission heeded the president's advice, famously concluding, and I quote, that our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white separate and unequal. The Kerner Commission laid bare some uncomfortable truths, truths that many Americans were unprepared or unwilling to face. And for reasons that are still widely debated, its recommendations went largely unheeded. And we're going to hear about some of this this evening. Well-meaning people disagree, and we continue to disagree, and that's fine. And But here, they're disagreeing on whether or not the commission's policy prescriptions were the right ones. Well, if we keep waiting for a perfect right thing, we're never going to get anywhere. So here you have people stepping up, looking at something extremely complicated and say, let's just start here. We can start the discussion here. And some people say that was a failure. I don't see it as a failure. Um, just a month before the report was released, North Vietnamese had launched the Tet Offensive. <clears throat> Debate over the war left little room in the political discourse for anything else, as we all see wars do kind of like take the air out of the room. But in this case, um, in, in things, things we talk at school, you can always multitask when you've got really important issues. So I'm not so sure I buy into this idea. Um, I'll defer discussion of these important matters to the panel. But what I believe is indisputable is that the issues identified by the Kerner Commission 50 years ago remain powerfully relevant today. We were talking earlier, and if you take names out and you take dames out, you know, dates out, you can be reading about this today. The forces of the commission deemed responsible for the discord of 1967, it called it the explosive mixture. They're still present in 2018. We have discrimination. We have segregation. We have poverty. We have police brutality. We have frustrated hopes and feelings of powerlessness. So some of these very things that are in the ether in our country are still here now, 50 years later. One of the commission's warnings seems particularly prescient. Quote, to pursue our present course will involve the continuing polarization of the American community and ultimately the destruction of basic democratic values. This did not mince words. 
In some ways, we are confronting the same results of that unresolved polarization now. Racial tensions persist, and they remind us that America's racial history is anything but finished. In this way, President Johnson was also prescient when he said to the commission, quote, the work that you do ought to help guide us not just this summer, but for many summers to come and for many years to come. 50 years after its creation, we have much to learn from the Kerner Commission. And I'm pleased to be able to revisit this rare moment of national reflection with such an exceptional group of panelists. And I'm so pleased you know, that Senator Fred Harris is here. Um, I can't imagine what he really feels like. Can you imagine being on this commission and then coming 50 years later and revisiting it with people? I mean, how often do you get to do that? And how often do we have a chance to really be with somebody who has that longevity, persistence in this area? Uh, but I've taken enough time. I think we need to get moving on this. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Peniel Joseph. He's the founding director of the Center of the Study of Race and Democracy, uh, which, is, uh, which lives in the LBJ School. And peniel has been with us a short time. He's made a big impact on the university. He's cultivated numerous alliances and brought so many uh, important thinkers and doers here to the campus. So I'm really pleased uh, to turn this over to Dr. Peniel Joseph. Okay, I'm gonna be quick. I have the honor of introducing the three uh, panelists. Um, our first is, uh, of course, Senator Fred Harris. Um, senator Harris is the uh, former senator from Oklahoma, is the only living member of the Kerner Commission. Um, and Harris taught political science for 40 years at the University of New Mexico. His legacy of education continues through the University of New Mexico's Fred Harris Congressional Internship. Um, and Senator, Senator Harris is really the person who um, gave President Johnson the idea of even having this commission. And President Johnson put uh, Senator Harris on that commission. And we're going to hear all about that as well. Uh, we have the Honorable Julian Castro, who's a currently a visiting distinguished professor here at the LBJ School, or not here at the library, but at the LBJ School next door. Um, he's dedicated his career to public service. In 2001, Castro was the youngest council member to be elected to the San Antonio City Council. He continued to serve as the mayor of San Antonio from 2009 to 2014, heading the San Antonio 2020 initiative to create a far-reaching blueprint for San Antonio's future. Uh, Castro served as the Housing and Urban Development Secretary under the Obama administration from 2014 to 2017. And currently, as I mentioned before, he's the Dean's Dis Distinguished Fellow and the Fellow of the Davia Chair in International Trade Policy at the LBJ School of Public Affairs. And we also have Dr. Kathleen McElroy, who currently serves as Associate Director for the School of Gen Journalism and Fellow of the S. Griffin Singer Endowed Professorship in Journalism. Starting this summer, Dr. McElroy will assume the position of Director of School of Journalism. Congratulations, that's great. She received her PhD from the School of Journalism here at UT uh, after nearly 30 years as a prof professional journalist, uh, including at the New York Times, where she held various management positions, including associate managing editor, uh, dining editor, deputy sports editor, and deputy editor of the website. While earning her doctorate, she was a Harrington Graduate Fellow and received awards for teaching and research. Uh, her research interests include racial discourse, collective memory, sports media, and obituaries. Um, very quickly, uh, briefly, um, this is the 50th anniversary of the publication of this report. Uh, we are at a really important historical juncture uh, in America. Um, the Kerner Commission provided us uh, a blueprint for the radical transformation of American democracy. The report really grows out of the social movements of the post-war period. And these are social movements for small d democracy. Sometimes we call them civil rights, sometimes we call them feminists, sometimes we call them um, LGBTQ, labor movements. But what all these movements wanted was human rights for all, both in the United States and globally. What's so important about the Kerner Commission is that the Kerner Commission took steps for proactive political, social, and cultural transformation. These were public servants who spoke truth to power, even at the cost of their own careers and reputations, because it was the right thing to do. 
And when we think about this report 50 years later, this report talks about education, it talks about health care, it talks about jobs, it talks about prisons and the criminal justice system, it talks about all these democratic institutions in American civil society and the way in which those institutions weren't working on behalf of one group of Americans, right? In this case, it's African Americans, but this can be extended to Latinos, it can be extended to Native Americans, it can be extended to poor whites, it can be extended to a broad coalition of Americans. The reason I feel optimistic on a day like this, and um, Senator Harris and Dr. Alan Curtis have a great book uh, called Healing Our Divided Society, investigating the Kerner Commission 50 years later that just came out. The reason why I feel so optimistic in spite of mass incarceration, in spite of the need for the Me Too movement, in spite of what's going on with immigration and the dreamers, is that the Kerner Report provides a snapshot for a different period in time that connects with our current social, political, racial, economic crises. And that snapshot shows that there are always groups of people, in this case, both public servants, elected officials, civil rights activists, who are willing to organize and speak truth to power to try to rectify inequalities. What's so important about this is that even though we have tremendous challenges, what the Kerner Commission decided was that we could actually win those challenges, but we needed to have an all-out effort which, which would echo the New Deal, which would echo the run, run up to the Second World War to defeat and eradicate these inequalities. So this report is optimistic. It's brutally honest in its assessment of inequality. It's brutally honest in its assessment of residential segregation. It's brutally honest in its assessment of the relationship between criminal justice and poor black communities. But it was also optimistic because it said, we didn't need to give up. We could actually achieve what James Baldwin called our country and achieve our nation. What Baldwin meant by that was a nation in a country that had eradicated the last vestiges of racial slavery, gender discrimination, and any and all kinds of inequalities. We can do it. That's what makes us Americans. When we talk about things like the, the, the national anthem and Confederate monuments, we're, we're critiquing Confederate monuments because they're un-American. This country is based on liberty and freedom and justice for all people, irrespective of their backgrounds. The reason why Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the great wells of democracy from a, a jail cell in Birmingham is because he believed in democracy. He had seen people bleed and die for democracy, not just overseas, but domestically. So the Kerner Report is a shining example of the willingness of Americans to believe in the American dream not just to imagine it, but to make it real in our own lifetimes. 50 years ago, Senator Fred Harris and those on the commission were willing to speak truth to power at great cost. And 50 years later, we revisit this time period because we can do no less in our own time period for our children, for our grandchildren, for humanity and society. So we should feel optimistic even though we confront extraordinary challenges, but the, the optimism is rooted in the fact that this country has always faced extraordinary challenges, and each time the country pulls itself together, it can actually eliminate and overcome those challenges. That's what makes this nation great. But we are only true to our identity as liberty's surest guardian if we are willing to be honest and outspoken and courageous and faithful to the precepts of American democracy. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. And so, in closing, <laughs> what is so important about the Kerner Commission is the way in which it sets up solutions, proactive solutions for the crises that we face, not just then, but in our own lifetimes. We can eradicate mass incarceration. We can end child poverty. We can end public school segregation. We can transform this society 
if we are willing to speak truth to power and organize and believe in the dream of not just our founders, but those who have become principal architects of American democracy by being social movement leaders, by being feminist leaders, by being civil rights leaders, by being environmental leaders, by being uh, public school leaders, by being public servants, we can transform the way in which our country works and operates for the least of these. That's why Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that we could all be great because we could all serve to try to transform this society on behalf of human rights, liberty, equality, and freedom for all. Thank you. I'm going to just say... Dr. Eric Tang, my friend, I, I forgot, director of the Social Justice Institute who really helped us organize all of this um, is going to be the moderator for this panel. Well, that's this second best introduction I ever had. <laughs> the best introduction I ever had was when the guy was supposed to introduce me didn't show up and I had to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret and I, my wife Margaret Elliston and I, we've been running around all over the country this 50th anniversary. We were in New York last Monday and then in D.C. And on Tuesday and in Baltimore Wednesday. And uh, then we went to Chicago on Thursday. Now we're here. It gets to be kind of a blur. But one thing that, that really strikes me going around the country like this is what a lot of good people there are, people like Dr. Joseph, and who are really doing things. There, there's a lot of good things going on in this country. I, uh, I'm really honored to be here. I spent, I had breakfast this morning with my great old friend Jim Hightower. Anybody, anybody even know Jim? Jim was my campaign manager when I ran for president. And the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the late Fort Worth Star-Telegram, one time I asked him, said, is it true that you were Fred Harris's campaign manager when he ran for president. And, uh, and Hattar said, that's true. He said, I made Fred Harris what he is today, a college professor. <laughs> <laughs> I was, one time, Margaret and I were living in London, and I was teaching there, and about midway through the uh, semester, to illustrate some point, I said, uh, when I thought everybody knew then my, my background. I said, when I ran for president, and there was a young woman, and actually she was from Iowa. She was in the front row, and she almost jumped out of her seat. She said, you ran for president? And I said, yes, I did. She said, president of what? <laughs> I, I, I said, president of the United States. She said, president of the United States? I said, yes, and I should tell you I was not elected. She wrote that down. <laughs> oh my God, this may be on the, fi on the final. <laughs> and then I spent some time, I'd never been to the LBJ library, so we put, spent some time on that, and I brought back a lot of good memories. All the good things we were, we were doing, Vietnam was a, just a small little thing off over here we weren't thinking much about, and the, of course the riots had not occurred yet. And look at all those, those things we did. My goodness, more legislation President Johnson got passed. Really good stuff. Federal Aid to Education, the Elementary Secondary Education Act, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We made uh, a, a lot of progress. And, and uh, it was uh, my honor to uh, serve during a good many of those years with President Johnson. So I want to thank uh, Eric Tang and others here for inviting me, and uh, Director Evans. I'm really impressed with what's going on here at the uh, LBJ School of Public Affairs. And 
I, I just want to, I've been asked to speak about the origins and the operations of the Kerner Commission, uh, of which I was a member, of course, and, and as was said, the last surviving member. Hightower the other day, some newspaper article said that I was the last surviving member. He sent me, he sent me an email and said, you ought to put that on your tombstone, the last survivor. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, uh, and then I want to get to, after talking about the history and origins of the Kerner Commission, I want to say more about the, what's, uh, where we are now in regard to the issues of race and poverty and what we can and should be doing uh, 50 years later. On the evening of July the 27th, 1968, uh, my wife and I were gathered with a couple of invited friends in front of a television set we'd brought into our living room to watch President Lyndon Johnson's nationwide broadcast, during which he was expected to announce the appointment of a Blue Ribbon Citizens Commission, what became the President's National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, called, as you know, the Kerner Commission, after its dedicated chairman, Governor Otto Kerner of Illinois. The presidential broadcast uh, had been announced in the wake of the terrible riots and violent protests that had exploded in the black sections of so many of America's cities during that long, hot summer of 1967, with great loss of life, awful human injury, enormous property destruction, which all caused a great shock and fear and alarm, bewilderment and anxiety throughout the country. The worst disorders were in Newark and Detroit, and they were not to be quelled until uh, President Johnson had sent in U.S. Army troops. My wife and I and uh, some friends were seated in front of the television that uh, July of 1967, when, as I've told some of you this morning, uh, not more than 10 minutes before the president was supposed to come on, my youngest daughter, Laura, then in the second grade, came running in from the kitchen where we had a wall telephone, and she said, Daddy, President Johnson is on the phone for you, which, <laughs> as I said this morning, caused a little stir in the living room. So I went into the kitchen where we had the wall telephone, and I picked it up. I was standing at attention, and <laughs> I, I said, <laughs> that's literally true. Yes, sir, Mr. President. And he said, Fred, I hope you're going to watch television tonight. I said, I am. He said, I'm going to appoint that commission you've been uh, talking about. Well, here's a little flashback. I was then a United States senator, of course, and three days earlier when the D Detroit riots were at their worst, after getting, getting my friend and uh, seat mac, seatmate, uh, Senator Walter Mondale, to co-sponsor it, I introduced in the Senate a resolution to create a Blue Ribbon Citizens Commission to look into the riots, not just from a law and order standpoint, but also to get, a, to get at fundamental causes and to come up with recommendations, quote, to make good the promise of America for all Americans immediately. I had the resolution sent to the subcommittee, which I chaired, and I held hearings on it that very next morning. My, some of my witnesses, one of them was Whitney Young, head of the, the Urban League. But then it dawned on me that we didn't have to wait for congressional action, that President Johnson could himself name the commission by executive order. I called uh, Douglas Cater of the White House staff and urged such presidential action, and I followed up the call, as Doug uh, Cater asked me to, with a hand-delivered formal letter to the president. So back now to President Johnson's telephone call to me. He said, I'm going to appoint that commission you've been talking about. I said I was glad to hear it. He said, I'm going to put you on it. And I said, I, I, I didn't expect that, but I'll, I'll do my best. He said, and all, all of this, as I said this morning, all of this is word for word. He said, now don't you be like some of your colleagues. He said, I, I point them to things and they don't show up. I said, I, I'll show up. And another thing, Fred, uh, the president said, I said, again, I said, yes, sir, <laughs> mentally saluting at least. He said, I want you to remember you're a Johnson man. I said, yes, sir, I am a Johnson man. He said, if you forget it, 
I'm going to take my pocket knife and cut your blank off. He, he did not say blank. He said, you're from Oklahoma. You understand that kind of talk, don't you? I said, yeah, yes, sir, I do. I, I went back into the living room and they said, what did he say? What did he say? I said, well, some of it was a little personal. <laughs> that, uh, it, it is a sad thing to me that by the time our report came out, uh, the president thought that I had forgotten I was a Johnson man. He did not agree with, uh, with our report. Now, back now, uh, though, to July 29, 1967. On that day, the 11 members of the commission were called together by telegram. We met in the White House cabinet room that first meeting with President Johnson, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, Attorney General Ramsey Clark, Budget Director Charles Schultz, uh, and Cyrus Vance, the man that the president had put in charge of U.S. Army troops that he'd called out to uh, Newark and Detroit. After calling on Vance to give us an up-to-date report on the situation in Detroit, and the rights were still going on there, the president gave us our marching orders. He charged us, the Kerner Commission, to investigate the riots and recommend action, uh, using pretty much the words that I had used in, um, in, in my resolution, not only from a law and order standpoint, but also in regard to their deeper causes. He said, let your search be free. And he said, find the truth and express it in your report. And that is exactly what the commission famously did, which as it turned out, not only shocked the conscience of the country, but greatly upset President Johnson as well. A highly competent and caring Washington attorney, David Ginsburg, was named as the commission's executive director. He rapidly hired an outstanding staff, and the commission set to work. In the treaty room of the executive office building adjacent to the White House, we held 20 straight days of hearings from August to December of 1967, with 130 witnesses, ranging from civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Contracts were let for serious academic and other studies, staff members and consultants working for the commission began to conduct field surveys in 23 cities, including more than 1,200 interviews, attitude and opinion surveys, and other serious studies of conditions and causes. Commission members then broke into teams for site visits to the riot cities and personally observed their uh, close up the human cost of wretched poverty and harsh racism. Mayor John Lindsay and I were a two-person team for those uh, site visits, as we'd already automatically and almost from the first, despite disparate backgrounds, made ourselves into a close working two-man team for our common goal, goals for what the commission ought to do and say. Mayor Lindsay and I, for example, went to Cincinnati for a closed, no press meeting with a well-educated and successful group of young male and female black militants, a well-educated and successful group, as I said, and a meeting that it had taken our staffs more than a, a week to set up. None of these young men and women wanted to be there. None would even shake hands with us. One young man said, expressed the view of all of the rest of them when he said, he couldn't stand to even look at white people anymore. One way or another, all of them said they didn't trust white politicians. And they added uh, the, those racist uh, President Johnson and, and Vice President Humphrey either. And white politicians like you two, they didn't trust us to do anything about racism and poverty. John, John Lindsay, as mayor, and I, among other things, as a member with Robert Kennedy of the Senate's Ribicoff Committee, which had been looking into urban problems, already knew that such alienation and hostility existed. But still, uh, this experience affected us greatly. With a local anti-poverty worker, uh, John Lindsay and I then, in suits, uh, 
of course, walked the streets of Cincinnati where the riot and the disorders had occurred. We came upon a group of young black men, typical of those who'd taken part in the disorders, idling on a street corner. And they instantly uh, jumped up, gathered around us. One of them said, who are you, the FBI? <laughs> the, he, uh, the, the, the poverty worker with us uh, told them who we were and what we were doing there. And then they all began to say almost in a chorus, get us a job, baby. We need jobs, baby. One young man said, Mr. Johnson got me a job last summer, but it run out. He was talking about the president, President Johnson, and the summer work program. For John Lindsay and me, as well as for the rest of the commission, jobs was to become a central theme in our findings and recommendations. Mayor Lindsay and I went to Milwaukee. I spent the better part of the morning uh, uh, there in a black barber shop talking with the young black men as they came in. Most were from the South. Having come to Milwaukee looking for work, just as local jobs were disappearing or uh, being moved away. The first question I asked the early arrivals uh, puzzled them. The, that question was whether they found more or less racial discrimination in Milwaukee than there had been in Birmingham or wherever it was they'd come from. They didn't know how to answer because as I soon learned in Milwaukee, they didn't see any white people. They, that's how rigid the local segregation was in that northern city. Mayor Lindsay and I and the other commission members came back from these site visits, sobered and somewhat shaken. In a room which I arranged for on the Senate side of the U.S. Capitol building, the commission then met for uh, 44 days uh, of meetings from December 67 until nearly the end of February 68 to actually write the Kerner Report, every word of which was read aloud, then discussed and revised before being approved by majority vote of commission members. On harder questions, decisions would sometimes turn on a vote of six to five. For example, when we decided to say white racism, there were members on our commission who preferred a little kinder words like uh, prejudice or discrimination. We thought it was important to say racism. It was important for uh, uh, young black kids, for one thing. We knew that oppressed people very often come to hold the same bad stereotypes about themselves that the dominant society believes. And we wanted them to know that they weren't crazy, that there was a great deal of racism. And so we said the words. We were the first government uh, uh, agency ever to use the word uh, racism. That was a six to five vote. We also had a six to five vote on whether there was a conspiracy. President Johnson believed that these riots and disorders were organized, that there was a conspiracy uh, be behind them. And uh, I, one time I was down at the White House, he also incidentally was worried about John Lindsay running for president against him. <laughs> I went, one time I went down to the White House with a constituent uh, thing a uh, uh, with my fellow Senator Mike Monroney, and we were going to introduce Jane Ann J. Rowe from Oklahoma, the new Miss America. And we went down there. As, as we came in, you could always tell President Johnson, his eyes were kind of hooded and <laughs> he, he, pretty low key in his uh, shaking hands with you. you. You knew you weren't in too good order. He was getting word all the time what was going on in the commission, what John Lindsay and I were up to. And he shook hands with Mike Monroney and he said, how are you, Mike? Good to see you. And he said, how are you, Mr. A. Rowe? I'm glad to meet you. Then he said to me, Fred, he said, I'm surprised to see you up. I, I said, what? He said, I heard old John Lindsay had you down and had his foot on your neck. He said, stick around here. Uh, so I did. And he talked to me about conspiracy. And the other day, I, 
listen again to his broadcast when he appointed this commission. And in that broadcast, he said, I'm asking the FBI to continue to look into the question of whether there was a conspiracy behind these riots. Well, he talked to me about that. And I said, no, Mr. President, I said, it's not like that. I said, there are thousands of Stokely Carmichael's and H. Rapp Browns that you and I have never heard of. And then I knew he was a, a student of Franklin Roosevelt, as I've said to some of you. So I said to him, <laughs> who knows what kind of ideologies people would have followed, what kind of actions they might have taken if Franklin Roosevelt hadn't taken away uh, their audience by getting at the basic problems that they were complaining about. And he said to me, uh, have you read these FBI reports on each of the riots? I said, no, but we, we had J. Edgar Hoover before us. And he's, I think it was Marvin Watson, one of his staff members, he said, uh, get Fred these uh, FBI reports on each of the riots. And then he told me, he said, you come in tomorrow morning, I want you to go over these. Well, I did, and they, <laughs> they were like this. They'd be about 15 or 20 pages like, the, say, the Cambridge, Maryland report. Uh, and in it, and first of all, uh, I think I mentioned this to some of you, you could tell these FBI people making these reports, they hadn't a clue of what was going on in the country or, 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 or why. But at any rate, there, in that Cambridge report, and the same in these others, there was a line where it said, uh, a source close to this bureau reports that, uh, uh, I think it was like a week and a half ahead of the riots here, the uh, H. Ramp Brown was reported to have been in Cambridge. Well, then on the top of that report was a two-page report that the FBI report, uh, the FBI had made a summary uh, of the report. And it, it, by now it's getting a little clearer that H. Ramp Brown was there a week and a half. And then on top of that report, and this was true with all of them, there was a one-page summary written by the White House, and now H. Rapp Brown is there. He, you can practically hear him agitating for, for this riot. That's what the president was seeing. The, uh, in our report, and there was a six to five vote on that, and we said There's, there was no conspiracy. And uh, one of our members said, well, but do we actually want to say that we don't think there was any conspiracy? And well, we don't believe it, do we? No. Well, the president said, tell the truth. So let's just say there wasn't, this wasn't an organized plan. There wasn't a conspiracy. Six to five vote. David Ginsburg, our wonderful uh, executive director, and I might say this. By the time we got to the end, our report was adopted unanimously. Everybody signed it. And David Ginsburg one time said, this is the only unanimous report that was adopted by a six to five vote. <laughs> and there was a lot of truth in that. In our report, we condemned violence and lawlessness in uh, the strongest terms, saying that, that they, quote, nourish repression, not, not justice. And our basic and most famous finding, as Director Evans said a while ago, was our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. And the report stated further, segregation and poverty have created in the racial ghetto a destructive environment totally unknown to most white Americans. And we added, what white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro, as we said in those days, but what the Negro can never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. Great and sustained national efforts were required, we said, not only to combat racism, but also to greatly expand social programs, including those against unemployment and low wages, poverty, inferior or inadequate education and training, lack of health care, and bad or non-existent housing. The report also made strong recommendations for improving the conduct of the media and the police and for needed integration of housing and schools. These recommendations applied to all Americans. We said in the report, quote, rural and urban 
white, black, Spanish surname, and American Indians. But misinformed about the contents of the report, distracted terribly by the Vietnam War, President Johnson rejected the Kerner Report. And as I've said, this is particularly sad because President Johnson did more against poverty and racism than any other president before or since. Luckily, our staff had made an early deal with Bantam Books to publish the whole report on its issuance date, March 1st, 1968, so there was no possibility that it could be suppressed or filed away unread, no matter what. However, the report was purposely leaked to the media by a person who, in my opinion, wanted to lessen its impact. And I should mention that a memo from a White House staff member to President Johnson was lately found that actually uses those words. Should we leak the report to lessen its impact? In any event, the report was leaked to the press before the commission could, as we'd planned, background reporters so that they would fully understand the reasons for the commission's findings and recommendations. And this leak resulted in hastily written news stories which appeared throughout the country the next morning. Uh, and one guy I remember, it was just chaos that night, reporters calling all of us. I remember an Associated Press reporter called me, this is a 600 page report. And he said, I have a 30 minute deadline can you just kind of capsulize <laughs> this, this report? Well, the headline the next morning in the Washington Post and pretty much all around the country was something like this. White racism cause of black riots, commission says. Many people never learned uh, the rest of the story. Uh, my father, a small farmer in southwest Oklahoma, uh, he, he, he had about a third grade education. He loved me, but the way he heard the Kerner report was, Mr. Harris, out of the goodness of your heart, uh, you ought to pay more taxes to help poor black people who are rioting in Detroit. And my dad's reaction was, to hell with that. I'm having a hard enough time myself. I'm already paying too much tax. And he was right about that. Well, I could explain it to my dad and did. But a lot of other people never knew that we were as interested in them as we were uh, black people and Latino people. There was, not surprisingly, considerable backlash in the country. Still, many American leaders spoke out in favor of the Kerner Report, including Vice President Hubert Humphrey, Senator Robert Kennedy, my seat mate in the Senate, uh, people like, for example, great Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, John Gardner. John Gardner said, uh, we're in deep trouble as a people and history will not deal kindly with any nation which will not tax itself to cure its miseries. And Willard Wirtz, Secretary of Labor, I think, he, he got about the best uh, size up. He said, you could, you could uh, condense what the Kerner Commission said uh, in the words of that great American philosopher, Pogo, who said, we have met the enemy and he is us. Well. Dr. Martin Luther King called the commission report, quote, a physician's warning of approaching death with a prescription for life. And despite the opposition, America made progress on virtually every aspect of race and poverty for almost a decade after the Kerner report. For example, we were just talking about earlier today, we, the high point on on integration of schools and housing was uh, in the 1980s. Uh, and it's after that that we began to fall back. We've made great progress uh, in regard to desegregation of schools and, and of housing. And the same is true about the achievement gap. The achievement gap in schools between African Americans and white kids was narrowing rapidly. Uh, with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and with other enforcements. And, and for example, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Darling Hammond, for example, uh, said, Linda Darling Hammond, uh, just lately, that if that trend of the gap closing uh, 
had continued, there wouldn't be any achievement gap between black kids and white kids right now. But we, we, we began to go the other way. We made a great deal of progress, as you know, the, the number of African-American and Latino elected officials increased, as did their numbers in the middle class and in all aspects of uh, American life. We elected an African-American president. But with jobs alarmingly disappearing through globalization and automation, <coughs> with conservative political change, and eventually with unfriendly U.S. Supreme Court decisions, as well as congressional cuts in both taxes for the rich and big corporations and in programs that benefited poor and middle-class Americans, progress was slowed or stopped and finally reversed. Some improvement occurred, of course, during each of the Bill Clinton and Barack Obama administrations, but regression has been the trend since the uh, late 70s, and that's true today. There's still far too much excessive force by police, too often deadly force, especially against African Americans. White supremacists have become bolder and more violent. Housing and schools have been rapidly resegregating, locking too many African American and Latino kids into slums and their children into inferior schools. As the nation has grown, our overall poverty rate has stubbornly remained virtually the same, while the total number of poor people has increased from a little over 25 million uh, to a little over 40 million uh, as of 2016. Ever since the 1970s, the African-American unemployment rate has continued to be about double that for whites. Latino unemployment continues high as well. Labor union membership has shrunk from about 25% of private jobs to about 6%. Inequality of income in our country has greatly worsened. Uh, for example, 52% of all new income in America has gone to the top 1% in recent years. Rich people are healthier and live longer. What's fair about that? They get a better education, and a better education produces greater inequality of income. And then that greater economic power translates into greater political power. So where do we go from here? We know what needs to be done, and we know what works. A more progressive tax system making rich people and big corporations pay their fair share. Stopping tax and spending subsidies that redistribute wealth and income in the wrong direction. Strengthening unions and eliminating the legal and other barriers which impedes the right of workers to organize. Raising the minimum wage to a living wage which would be a, a giant boost to the economy and bump up middle wages, middle class wages too. We need more affordable housing and housing and schools integrated by income and race. We also need re-regulation of big banks and big finance. Better income for those who can't work and who can't find work. A sound, free public education for all from early childhood through college. My first year at the University of Oklahoma, first semester, my tuition was $48. I'd learned to trade so I could go through school and then through law school uh, as a printer, and, and I was able to do that. My grandson can't do that. Look what's happened to tuition in these schools and the public universities, and there are no jobs for people like him. Education and training with special attention to those put out of work by circumstance, circumstances beyond their control. Health care for all. The basic American principles of equal rights and equal opportunity for all, whatever a person's social standing, zip code, religion, gender, or color. Investment in infrastructure, in science, in alternative energy and technology. Investment in ourselves. Well, how can we get these things done when present times are so politically tough. First, I think we can take heart from the fact that the great civil rights movement led by Dr. Martin Luther King and John Lewis and others began in a terrible and depressing time of Jim Crow, rigid segregation, and harshest racism. The odds were overwhelmingly against them, but still they courageously resisted, persisted, and ultimately prevailed. We can take heart, too, I think, from the fact that the polls show 
that the majority of Americans support the measures that we must now adopt and the steps which we must now take. We can take heart from the fact that we live in a time of unprecedented, growing, and powerful people's activism with great new efforts and organizations like the Women's March, Indivisible, and Black Lives Matter. Finally, the Reverend William Barber of North Carolina, founder of the rapidly spreading Moral Mondays movement and a new Poor People's Campaign, is right when he says, we can't keep fighting in our silos. No more separating uh, the issues. Labor over here, voting rights over there. The same people fighting one should have to fight all of us together. Reverend Barber is pointing the way, I think, the way we must go, showing that white, black, Latino, and other Americans can join hands in coalition to work for their common interests, uh, women, millennials, seniors, the LGBTQ community, immigrants, and others, because, as I like to repeat, everybody does better when everybody does better. Thank you. So I'm going to moderate a conversation with um, our other panelists. But before I do, I want to say how fitting it is that we are in this room discussing the Kerner Report. Um, because right behind us, be, be, be beyond these, uh, this glass wall, sits the documents of the Kerner Commission. So the... Um, the 130 folks who were who testified, their testimonies can be read right across the hall. The um, FBI reports, if you want to read them, they're right there. And I send my students to go read them as, as part of um, their, their classroom assignment. And you know, one of the things that I think is interesting is that these FBI reports, which ultimately found that there was no conspiracy, are still really valuable because in determining that there was no conspiracy, what they did was they went into neighborhoods and asked a lot of questions and tried to figure out, well, who was behind it? And what they found out was everyday people were behind it. You know, teachers, um, single moms, young people who were unemployed and looking for work, college students. And that, if you think about it, is a trove of information about how social movements take shape. They take shape among everyday people who are struggling for their future. All right? And all that can be found right behind me. So I want to show you the um, paperback version, the original paperback version of the Kerner Commission report. It's right here. And this um, became a national bestseller in 1968. Everybody was reading it. Right? You saw it in everyone's hands. And it became a national bestseller because it told the truth, because it was comprehensive. Right? And so despite the efforts of some to thwart the uh, commission's impact, it became um, arguably the most widely read government document in the history of our country. And Fred Harris um, thought it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, but let's return to this question of the media and its role in both misrepresenting what happened, because the next morning after it's leaked, you have these sensational headlines, right? Uh, but also, the media is uh, looked to as part of the problem by the Kerner Commission, and it actually has recommendations for the media, right, this private entity. It doesn't just have recommendations for the, um, the public sector. So, um, Kathleen, if you could say a few words about the impact of, um, of the media on the Kerner Commission, as well as the Kerner Commission's impact on the media. And by the way, Kathleen wrote an excellent dissertation about 
to the media and the Kerner Commission. I just thought I'd throw that in because I read it. Well, uh, I also want to um, give a shout out to Mercedes de Uriarte, a School of Journalism professor um, emeritus who has done such wonderful work on the Hushin, Hutchins Committee, the Kerner um, Report. So um, I'm sure she will correct me if I get anything wrong. <laughs> Um, but, you know, one of the questions that Johnson asked was, what effect do the mass media have on the riots? He and plenty of other folk thought that the media was provoking people to riot. You know, there were some instances in which when the cameras showed up, um, that people, you know, some reporters actually cajoled people to start throwing rocks. So there was a sense of, you know, what role did the media have? But first, I want to go back a little bit, just a minute or two, on... Um, you know, journalism as being the first draft of history, as Senator Harris says, it's an imperfect first draft many times. And um, as Ben Bradley said about the Washington Post coverage from 1965 to 1971, the newsroom was racist. So you have to understand that, yes, the media did an outstanding job covering the civil rights movement. There are some factors why. Um, they were covering Jim Crow South, right? They're covering the Deep South. They're looking at well-dressed Negroes being hosed by people like Bull Connor. Those are images made for media. TV plays a huge role in this. They interrupt um, Judgment at Nuremberg to show Selma. So you have all of this going on, and we get the Civil Rights Act, we get the Voting Rights Act, Less than a week later, Watts goes up, okay? So media, and if you read books on this, there are still some white journalists like, what happened? We don't get what happened. So clearly there was a focus on the deep south for most of this time, all right? But what's blowing up now? It's Newark, it's Detroit, it's Philadelphia, it's LA. So, and if you read the report, it focuses on ghettos. That's the key word. You know, they're talking about ghettos. So um, the Kerner Commission was very smart to actually have like this massive focus group weekend with the top journalists. The Times didn't participate, but I think it's, an, it's one black reporter was there, but correct me if I'm wrong on this. And um, so at, in the beginning, the media almost was invested in sort of like, did we cause this problem? When the report comes out, as Senator Harris um, uh, just said, there was this mad scramble because there wasn't a lot of time to figure it out. The Post got it first, so then the Times had to try to do it. And if you read the Times story, you do find key words, white racism. It's the easy thing to report, right? No one's going to go through the whole thing. And Nixon weighs in two or three days later, and it all starts, well, no, you, you know, you're blaming the wrong people. But interestingly enough, the chapter on media, chapter 15, in which the commissioners, um, I mean the, yeah, the commissioners said the three main conclusions was the media was sensationalist. Maybe they didn't mean to be, but that was the overall effect. But ultimately, most important, the media failed to report adequately on the causes and consequences of civil disorder and underlying problems of race relations. That's a key factor, the underlying problems of race relations. What are the two causes of that? Well, they're not reporting on Negro life. I think there's even this wonderful line in there where it says, you know, in the white press, Negroes don't get married. They don't go to the post office. Mm -hmm. So the only time that, you know, you are seeing African Americans in the press is, ooh, they're riding again. You know, so it's that type of factor. So it's almost pre-civil rights again in the way the coverage is, and the pathology that we're gonna get from Moynihan, it's all this stuff. But what's interesting is the other, you know, they say that we don't cover, media's not covering um, the ghetto, and part of the reason why it doesn't cover the ghetto well or cover riots well is because there are no black reporters in media. So some white guy with a TV truck shows up in Watts and people flip that bad boy over and that's the image, you know? And TV executives were thinking, hmm, this is not working the way we want it to. So the report recommends that media hire more people of color 
And that alone should help improve the coverage. Well, media love to talk about media. I, you know, I was talking to Professor Tang and it's like, media love to navel gaze. Oh, there's something wrong with us? <laughs> so interestingly enough, the Kerner Commission report probably had its most impact in news media. So all of a sudden, TV stations are picking, hey, you in the mailroom? Oh, you have a college degree? Come on, we're gonna put you on TV. It was almost that bad. Um, hiring went from less than 1% in newsrooms to maybe like three or 4% increase like fourfold, I think in um, like three or four years. Um, programs were set up on the East Coast and the West Coast. We needed to train black reporters. Um, there ended up being consequences of that. I will say now the number of um, people of color in newsrooms has gone up to 16%. Unfortunately, with the way the news industry is going now, um, young reporters of color and women are often laid off first because that's the history. But um, at one point, uh, a society of newspaper editors vowed that they were going to make the number of minorities in newsroom match the number of minorities in America. Well, they abandoned that before the 2,000-year goal came up. But to this day, Kerner is shorthand in newsrooms for newsroom integration. It's shorthand for how we should be covering race. So the Kerner Commission probably had its most visible impact on the private sector. So one of the things that um, becomes clear to me when I read the Kerner Commission report is the hopefulness that those who participated in the unrest um, were filled with. They were filled with this sense of promise. And this is the thing that I think is missed about urban unrest and the, even the misuse of terms like rioting, right? What you miss is that people who are engaged in this activity are optimistic. They're shifting their tactics politically from you know, nonviolent protest to violent protest, but not because they're nihilistic, but because they see this as the moment in which they can make the greatest impact if they shift their tactics. And it doesn't come as a surprise to us then that when the cities that saw the most intense uh, unrest were cities where um, the young people tended to be relatively more educated, tended to be more employed, and, um, and tended to have more political background than in cities that did not erupt in unrest. Right, so it's kind of counterintuitive. You would think that it's the hopeless who participated. That wasn't the case. And this is because those cities were still geographies of opportunity. There were still, there were still places where people could actually see themselves living a different future. Sadly though, 50 years later, cities are perhaps less um, geographies of opportunity today than they were in 1967. And a city like Austin is emblematic of that problem. We are the most economically segregated city in the country, meaning that social mobility here is, um, is at a very low point in a city like Austin. The, uh, the chances of a working class kid who was born in Austin or a working poor kid who was born in Austin moving out of that class and into a professional class or upper middle class is extremely low. Most people who make it in the city are those who already come with some resources, right? Who are already capitalized. And so I wanna to turn to Julian to ask, what do we do about this problem, economic segregation and the lack of social mobility that attends to our cities today? Yeah, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Tang, um, for the question and uh, of course to Senator Harris uh, and to our Dean. Uh, it's a great question, and you're right that Austin is a very good example of this. People seem to be locked in to where they are. Uh, your question is, what do we do about it? And of course, that has a lot of answers. I think that, um, you know, number one, when it comes to uh, opportunity, uh, we need 
as robust a commitment to education as there used to be for some people. You know? And lifelong education, as the Senator mentioned, when it comes to housing and neighborhoods, you need to give folks as much choice as possible. Either the choice to go to a quote unquote higher opportunity area or to stay in the neighborhood that they live in and that their family has lived in. East Austin is a great example of that. The African American population of East Austin has declined by almost 50% over the last 15 years. And so I think that uh, making progress starts with investing in people's opportunity and then giving them choice. And I know that you've worked a lot on affordable housing. Mm -hmm. You've worked, um, you know, both uh, at the level of being the mayor of San Antonio, but also Secretary of HUD. So what are some key strategies that you think um, are relevant today that were in many ways identified in the Kerner Report 50 yeah. years ago? Um, first of all, to making sure that you're investing in neighborhoods. One of the things that came out after this report was, I think, uh, a strategy of trying to disaggregate poverty, mm -hmm. right? But you know, we knocked down the Cabrini Green in Chicago, but it's almost like we didn't follow the people. Mm -hmm. We really didn't follow through and see if they had opportunity. We need housing uh, choice uh, and investment in neighborhoods so that people, as I said, can either stay or go if they want. And uh, today we have an administration that wants to take away $6 billion from the HUD budget. Mm -hmm. right? We're going backward. So the strategy begins with investment. It includes choice. And it also, I think, includes uh, trying to ensure that all of these things are connected together, housing and education and economic development and jobs and transportation. So uh, before we open it up to, to all of you, um, I wanted to touch on this question of social movements and uh, the idea that this long, hot summer of 67 and then again in um, 1968 with the urban unrest following the assassination of Martin Luther King, that these are part and parcel of a broader black freedom movement. This is ultimately what the Kerner Commission identified, that you couldn't take this event and say, oh, this is you know, the bad civil rights movement. We had the good civil rights movement from the early 60s through you know, 65, and then in 65 we saw Watts or the LA unrest, right? And then from then on out, 66, 67 in particular, our social movements turned bad. What the Kerner Commission identifies is no, this is actually a new phase of a long, unbroken black freedom struggle. And so with that in mind, and this is a question that um, you know, anyone on this panel can take up, where are our social movements today? You know, are we still um, in the time of movements? Well, I think so. I, my wife, Margaret Elliston, is the chair of the Sandoval County Democratic Party. Yeah. And uh, what, one thing is, uh, after the last presidential election, when people were having a hard time getting out of a fetal position, ourselves <laughs> included, they, she said it, it was a really fortunate thing that her undergraduate degree is in political science and her advanced degree is in counseling. <laughs> but she could, she could use both very well. And people kept coming talking to us, what can we do? And then my immediate reaction was, my mother always said, right in the corner where you are. As Cor Cory Booker says, everybody can do something. Uh, pick out whatever you're interested in, if it's Planned Parenthood or ACLU or whatever, and, and do something like that. And that's what we see now. For example, Marg has a, a first Friday meeting, and now it's gonna, it's gonna have to move out of the place where it regularly meets because it's standing room only. People get there, it starts at 1130, now people are getting there at 10, to try to get a seat. And that's true of all, a lot of other organizations that I belong to. Pe people want to do something. That, I think, is something new. Uh, there was a guy said to me the other day, a guy that I like a lot in, in Albuquerque, he said, Fred, this was last week, what can we do to change the climate in this country on guns? And I said, well, just this morning, I read in the New York Times that these kids down there in Florida are going to march on the White House and on the State House. Now, 
That could do it. And that's something different. I mean, it, that's a different thing. I think it's pivotal. Uh, this, the Women's March is, uh, uh, Margaret rode the bus going up to, to Washington. I went to Santa Fe where we had 12,000 people. And this last, we just had a sort of the second year or the next year of it. And I think there are more people involved. And, and that was a multiracial, multi-ethnic multi uh, thing. There's a, a lot of activism right now. One of the best things, maybe the only best thing that the president's done, President Trump, is to get us riled up and <laughs> want to do something. And I think that's a, that's a very hopeful sign. Um, I'll make two quick points on that. Uh, one of the things is media is no longer in the hands of just the Washington Post or the Dallas Morning mm -hmm. News or you know the Huntsville item. Um, I know you, social media helped create the world in which people are quote unquote fake news, but it also created you know Black Lives Matter and Me Too, and I think that's important. The other thing, media did a bad job of explaining to people, like my sisters who will vote once every four years, they will stand in line for three yeah. hours to vote once every four years without understanding that at what happens in state elections, that's where the gerrymandering takes place. And media now understand that you've got to focus on state elections. Not saying you have to change anyone's mind, but at least have that better informed citizenry. I would just say that we've had these spectacular examples in the last few years of movements that have impacted policy tremendously. A good example of that are the dreamers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there would be no DACA, no DAPA, and we wouldn't be in yes. the position that we're in without those young people that went out there and pushed and pushed and pushed. And so if we need an example, that's a concrete example of one that's made a difference. I agree. Uh, sure. Okay. So I think we're at the point in the evening where we're going to turn to your questions. And if I'm not mistaken, there are microphones on either side of the audience. So if um, you have a question, feel free to line up um, at the microphone. And um, the, uh, <laughs> before Dr. Joseph beats you to it. Good. The one person who doesn't need a microphone. Uh, journalist, uh, journalism professor, we've got Africana studies and American studies professor, we've got a sitting US senator, former senator, and we've got um, former Secretary of HUD um, on here. So I want to ask a very specific policy uh, question. Um, Matthew Desmond's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Evicted, uh, is about Milwaukee. And it's about racial segregation and homelessness. And Desmond makes a very compelling argument. He's a Harvard University professor who won a MacArthur Genius Award, but he used the entire Genius Award to set up a study of housing and homelessness in Milwaukee. First time it's ever been done. So he used 625, 650,000 to do that. And they interviewed all these different people in Milwaukee. He, he stayed with, with, with whites, with blacks, Latinos, a whole, whole group of people. And he makes the argument in Evicted that housing is the number one social issue of our time. And it's, I found it hugely compelling as somebody who teaches on mass incarceration, all these different things. But he's saying, if you don't have a house, you can't get a job, you can't get public assistance, you have a hard time sending your kids to school. And just in Milwaukee, he looked at the confluence between race, class, gender, and housing. And he found just a disaster. And this is all up to date. The book just came out a year, two years ago, won the Pulitzer Prize. But my question is, wh what can we do proactively about that, right? Because he connects housing to mass incarceration and criminal justice. People who have trouble finding housing oftentimes are in domestic, abusive, violent situations. When the cops come, they arrest women who've called about domestic violence. And those are usually women of color. And so families get dispersed because of this. So housing is this critical, critical issue. And I know uh, Secretary Castro was, was, was head of HUD, but what can we do proactively, not, not just in terms of um, a new election and certainly a whole new Congress, new president, but what, what can we do to make that 
what can we do to make that this agenda item that we are connecting to these other issues of Me Too and gun violence and mass incarceration? So what can we do proactively, both in Austin, but then statewide in Texas, and then nationally? Because again, that, a lot of our students here at LBJ were really impressed by that, by that book, and, and I was too, and I teach that book, but how housing is so, so key. Thanks a lot for the question. Um, I mean, number one is that we just don't have the same commitment to investing in housing opportunity that we used to. I'll give you a good example of that. Uh, CDBG, Community Development Block Grants, that most folks are very familiar with, which is the flagship program of HUD. Uh, in 1974 through about 1980, uh, it had maybe three or four billion dollars. Uh, if it were indexed today, it would have over $20 billion if it had kept up with that kind of investment. Today, it has less than $3 billion. So basically, you, you're investing what you were uh, in 1980. And today, only 29% of that money is actually used for housing, even though that was one of the, the main purposes. So when I talk about investment, we're not investing anywhere near what we were back then. Um, Secondly, I think that we need to be more creative than we were back then. It would be fascinating, for instance, to go back to those neighborhoods that y'all visited uh, as part of the Kerner Commission report, because you know what? If we went back to those neighborhoods, I bet that we would find a lot of them have been gentrified, that those folks that used to live there have been displaced, and that some of them, even here in Austin and other communities, have been displaced to what we, we, we consider suburban communities. And that means that you need a more nuanced type of approach to affordable housing. The problem is that a lot of these suburbs don't want to hear about creating affordable housing opportunity. They've never been, they don't think of themselves that way as, as places that need to do that. The big city is where you do that. But folks are getting driven out of the big city because they can't afford it anymore. Um, when I think about the Kerner Commission report and then I think about today, whether it's in education or housing, um, I think about that we used to have this commitment to a social safety net and to making opportunity possible and we used to, to tax and to spend accordingly. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, we started veering off into uh, being less willing to invest in ourselves just as these co cohorts of young people of color were growing up for the first time theoretically without the, the, the boundaries, the limitations of law, where they could try and really reach for their American dream. Except now, instead of $48 for the semester of, of you know, your tuition at University of Oklahoma, it's, I bet, you know, $20,000, $10,000 a semester, something like that. And um, we need to find a way in housing and education down the line to get back to the willingness to make those investments. You know, I'm really happy that you bring up the, um, the suburbs because there's no stopping the trend known as the suburbanization of poverty. It's, it's a, a runaway train. The fact that the suburban areas just outside of Austin here are the locations in which the rate of poverty is growing the fastest is almost irreversible. So if there's a distinction between, you know, 67 and 68 and 2017, 2018, it's that we can no longer think of the Kerner Commission recommendations in the context of the so-called inner city. We really need to think about how we create these opportunities in outlying areas. and. Um, Secretary Castro, you also brought up, that requires an integrated strategy. It can't just be about housing because you also have to make sure that people can get from the outlying areas to other parts of the city, transportation. Uh, they have to be in places where there's a robust school district. They have to be areas of opportunity as opposed to just thinking that the inner cities are what we need to focus on. Uh, you know, at the same time though, there's the ongoing displacement of long-standing residents within the inner city. And, and institutions with them. And those institutions, including um, their churches, which are tax exempt, but even they 
are saying, listen, it doesn't make sense for us to hold on within the inner city. Well, you know, one thing that came up in a conference that both Fred and I were part of last week in Berkeley, uh, and this was a recommendation made by a former head of the IRS, which is if you want to stop displacement, what you do is you make sure that the um, runaway property taxes that many of these longstanding residents are confronted with uh, do not drive them out. And he had a simple proposal. I forgot what the name, I forget what the name of the proposal is, but. John Koskinen was the, he said, if you want to call it the Koskinen plan, go ahead. Go ahead, right. <laughs> and the idea was to hold that property tax or speculated property tax in escrow. So you don't pull that money from them just because, you know, a house four times more expensive was built next door. You, um, you tell them this is what you would owe theoretically if you sold but we're gonna hold that in escrow until you do sell, yeah. right? And so things like that can be done because again, displacement is, is, is a huge issue and it's a particularly um, intense here in, in East Austin. Yeah, just to give you a, quickly, give you a sense of, of our lack of, I think, seriousness for, with regard to this issue. When I got to HUD, I wanted the department to focus more on displacement and gentrification. And I asked our research department, you know, basically, well, what do we have on that? Um, they said that we didn't have anything conclusive on the impact of gentrification because basically there has been a lack of, or there's a dearth of longitudinal analysis of what happens to people wow. who are displaced. Mm. So somebody, you know, somebody might not be able to afford the rent anymore and they have to leave, or somebody may quote unquote cash out and sell their home that all of a sudden is worth more, but we haven't Track. done a good job of tracking, of following them to understand who has a worse outcome, who has a better outcome. That was the answer that I got. Uh, but it shows you that we really haven't been prepared mm -hmm. to fully understand this issue. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Amin Habibnia. Uh, this builds off of Secretary Castro's uh, earlier point, and this is for Senator Harris. Making a decidedly hot-button topic not so hot-button for people that aren't willing to sit here and have the conversation. Uh, so clearly, this is something that has a lot of weight, has a lot of seriousness to it, but there's a, a common theme that's come up this evening, and as with everyone who's had this conversation within their own families on making this hot button topic issue something that we can talk about with folks that are going about their day, don't live this every day, at least they don't think they live this every day, mm -hmm. and making it open for a conversation that doesn't lead to people turning off their attention. Mm -hmm. uh, just even today, after you had a chance to meet my, my wife and daughter, she had a chance to call her mom I've known them for years. I had no idea that my wife's grandfather actually worked on your Senate campaign, and my mother-in-law and her sister actually got stopped by the police by accidentally stapling your flyers to the phone poles. They didn't know that was against the law. And we've never talked about any of these topics as a family, even though we should have. So, in your own lives, in your own families, in your own discussions, what are some of the maybe approaches you've taken to help, like you mentioned your father earlier, making this subject digestible, but more importantly, open to people who aren't just gonna gather in a small intimate setting like this tonight? Well, I was impressed with you this morning. I'm more impressed now when I hear about that. <laughs> Campaign activity. His in, name's in, Ansel Simpson. In your family. My, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, everybody can uh, do a little something, and we've all got some uh, uh, obligations in that respect. I think that somehow we ought to realize we're all living in the same house and getting acquainted with the people that are different from us or, and that we're all in this thing together. That's what we've got to somehow get across, and it's, it's hard to do. We, uh, and the media's got a, uh, an obligation here, of course, but I think uh, public officials have got an obligation they've been shirking. Uh, we, we got, uh, uh, I say we, they got on the national agenda poverty for the first time because John Kennedy ran for president and went out in Appalachia 
shaking hands with the coal miners and other desperately poor people, followed by the national press. You know, the press is better uh, of, of reporting real events rather than uh, on issues. Or we've, we've learned about the terrible racism and poverty in the Delta, Mississippi, because Robert Kennedy went there and, and visited in the homes of people, and the press followed him around. So I, when is the last time we've heard a national uh, 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 candidate, presidential candidate in particular, uh, allow the word poverty to slip through their lips? You, you haven't heard one in a very long time. People, we talk about the middle class and and the working class and so forth, but uh, we don't, you know, we don't hear people saying about poverty. And I think uh, that's, that's one thing. We, we've got to do something more than that. Then I think another, and I don't know how to, to do this on a national scale. John, uh, Jeff Foe and others have been talking about it, and a wonderful uh, African-American woman I met over the last week in Chicago, um, whose name is Gail Christopher. It, it, when I was uh, uh, fresh out of law school, and before the civil rights movement really got going, I was living in Lawton, Oklahoma. It was a town of about 75,000, I started practicing law there. And it was a, a army town, there was a military base right next door. And we started uh, with American Indians, but then we ex expanded it out, and we started having, uh, my wife and I and others, we started having, um, uh, a, a dinner, potluck dinner, one week in a black home and uh, the next week in a white home. And at first, it, it, we didn't talk about issues, we just getting acquainted, have a drink, eat a bite, just talk. And of course, what you find out is, uh, wait a minute, these people are just like us. They got the same worries about their kids and, and, uh, and, and, and they got a few more problems, these black people, than we do. But uh, uh, we got to know each other personally. And the first thing you know, it also got into where we would say, well, you know, J.C. Penney's will not hire any black, pe black people. And uh, we ought to go down there and uh, pick it in front of it, and we ought to get the commandant down here at Fort Sill to put them off limits. This was before the, and this had an enormous, if there was some way, and I think there is something going on like this on college campuses, getting people uh, together who have different backgrounds or different race or uh, ethnic uh, or gender or whatever and uh, and just getting to know each other personally somehow we that's that's one of the things that's so bad about segregation is we, we don't really understand what the other person's problems are and that's what we have to get across I think some way I don't know exactly how to do it but I think each of us has got some kind of uh, obligation to help do it I was going to say, there is a woman who had a question on this side, and she stood a long time. Yes. Well, well, it has. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is happening to some degree, but let me just say about, uh, the, the, tell you this. We uh, gave a contract to a group of academics at Brandeis uh, with the idea that they would come up with a, a test that could be applied to cities in the country to determine where a riot was more likely to occur, about to occur. And they came up with a, a, a group of, uh, of, uh, uh, of criteria, uh, you know, like how much poverty there is and what are the relations with the police and this and that. And we went over and said, yeah, that looks like a good uh, test. So they applied it to nine cities. Uh, for example, to Watts where there was a, a, a disorder in uh, 65 but not in 67. And they applied it to places where riots had occurred in 67. They applied it to Washington and Baltimore where people said there's too large a, a black middle class and, and they're never going to uh, have a riot. And what they found was that there was about to be a riot in every one of them. <laughs> their first thought was, well, wait a minute, there's something wrong with their test. But they, they 
came to the conclusion that the, there were such tensions and such conditions that that, that was true. So we, we said, we don't know what uh, causes violence in one place and not in another, but we can describe with particularity the conditions where this occurs, and that's, that's what we ought to focus on. So I don't know whether there's going to be more unrest or not. I hope not. But uh, I, would, I would just like to add that whether it's do the right thing or the real world, Ferguson or Baltimore, yeah. it's precipitated by what people consider the unnecessary death of a person of color, usually at the hands of the police. So this isn't like, I mean, and I know you, you weren't thinking that, but this isn't like, oh, we're gonna have a riot today. It's like, it's emotions based on something that has happened, something that people see as a sign of injustice. And our only reaction, I think as was the case 50 years ago, is that we need to let you know how we feel. And this is the only way that you seem to listen to us or respond. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I was just gonna quickly say, yeah, it's there was a spark, right? There was a spark in Watts. It was a traffic stop mm -hmm. that ignited it. Uh, the the uh, riots, L.A. riots after Rodney King and the the verdict there. Uh, I thought about this yesterday. I was watching HBO and I saw that documentary Traffic Stop mm -hmm. about Brianne mm -hmm. King mm -hmm. and the officer Richter, who I think was just fired, right, terminated recently. Um, and your question was, do we see anything that would make us think that there's still the possibility of this? You know, as long as there's inequality and the frustration that results, and then these incidents that provide that kind of spark, then unfortunately, sure, yeah, I do see that. Yes. First of all, thank you for being here. I feel very honored to be here tonight in your presence. Um, I was born in Macon, Georgia in 1958, a little context. So I was 10 years old when the report was written. I've been the Austin branch president of NACP since 2000, so I've seen a lot happen. And my question is, is given this report and its significance, when I look at, at cities in particular, I look at the budgets, and we still see the same budget. There's no money allocated or dedicated for poverty, for unemployment, for areas where you see displacement and gentrification. These are primarily local issues first. So I guess my concern is, given the fact this report proves that here's the cause of the problem, if you do the right things, you can fix the educational system, we know the importance of jobs, why do you think in 2018, with more information than ever before, with so many small people in this world, we struggle with the basic things like allocating money to certain areas that pay the same tax rate? So my question is, given all the information we have, all the technology, why do we struggle on a basic level with having a budget that reflects a small concern about inequity and the very things that create this predicament? And I have you respond. So the Kerner Commission got it right. Dr. Joseph and I were talking about this right before the panel. They got it right. Um, they knew what needed to be done. And in some small measure, they began to do it in the first decade, as Senator Harris pointed out. And so you see inequalities, um, sh you know, the gap uh, narrowing. But political forces ultimately decided that they didn't want to continue along that route. So it's not that we don't know what to do, right? It's not like we don't have the empirical data to show us what's going to work. What we don't have is the political will to implement these measures that will reduce public school inequality, that will reduce displacement, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. you know, what crystallizes, oh, I'm sorry, go oh, ahead. No, please, please. I was gonna say what crystallizes for me is the same year we did live aid to try to help mm -hmm. you know, poverty in African countries, we had farm aid yes. to try to help farmers. And I realized we used all the brain power of the world, and essentially the United States, and now we know African-American women, to put a man on the moon and to orbit the world. Yes. And now everything is like in our device. Like all the brightest minds of our generation are working at Apple or Dell, which are great, wonderful places. But there's like, now there's not this, this idea of what can we do for everybody. Yeah. 
how can the technology serve everybody? Facebook wants your friends, but is it really your friend? You know, and I'm not saying anything against Facebook, but just saying the great minds now, we don't seem to be working toward a common good. No, I think that's a great point. You know, that it's, it is harder these days to summon a common sense of purpose and common national identity. Mm -hmm. And there, your question was, you know, why when, when we know a lot of what we need to do, why in 2018 are we still having these conversations and have the conditions that we have? And one of the, I think, primary reasons for that is that there are too many people in politics who profit by not mm -hmm. and by dividing folks mm -hmm. and by, you know, remember uh, uh, Reagan and the welfare queen, Yes. you know, otherizing people and they're in their condition because they're lazy and, you know, everything to make other people feel better about themselves, basically and as though they don't need to make the investments that they should in communities. And, you know, that's not to say, right, like if we were to analyze all of the different programs that came out of <clears throat> the Great Society, that, that we wouldn't find some that were not as, not as effective as we wanted them to be. But we've had 50 years where we should have been learning and improving and improving in the delivery of those. Uh, and if we had continued to move forward past the 1970s, into the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and today, I think that we could have made a much bigger dent in income inequality and in racial segregation in the lack of opportunity for a lot of people in the country. Mm -hmm. I do want to add one last thing because I was talking about those companies, and I think Dean um, Davis would agree with me. Universities now have to take a greater role. Mm -hmm and community outreach. And I think a lot of these companies are willing to work with us to make this a better place. If our governments don't have the wherewithal or can't do it, I think this is a spot for the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. You know, if what starts here can change the world, we're, we're gonna start trying to change the world. Yes, good. So, Senator Harris, final thoughts before we close? Well, I think, uh, you know what Obama used to say, you are the future you've been waiting for. Mm. There's a lot of power in this room. And, and as I said, everybody can, can do something. And what we've got to do is somehow is get people to see that their own self-interest is in doing something about this. You know, I've, I've had people say to me, well, why should I care about somebody not having uh, health insurance? I have health insurance myself. Well, you says, wait, wait a minute, you gotta see what's happening with those people. They, they're waiting until they're really sick and then they go to the emergency room, and you're paying for that with your taxes. Or, for example, you say, well, well why should I push for uh, raising the minimum wage? I already get the minimum. I already get $15 an hour or whatever. Well, wait a minute. That, we're not just going to raise the wages of those people that are getting less than the minimum wage, but that's going to bump up yours, too. And it's going to put a lot of money into the economy to create more jobs. And what are you doing now? You're, you're saying, well, uh, let Walmart pay a, a wage that people can't live on. That's, a, that's not my business. I don't have anything to do with it. But yes, you do, because we're not going to let those people starve, and your taxes are paying for food stamps for those people. Why shouldn't they be able to take care of themselves by their own work? Now, some way, we've got to talk to people about their own self-interest, and that we are in this thing together, all of us. And I think we, we need to show them that we can do this. I, Dolores Huerta is, is, grew up in New Mexico. She comes from New Mexico. And she's the one that, uh, when she was a fellow agitator with Cesar Chavez, she came up with this phrase, which I think Obama helped popularize, and we ought to repeat to ourselves as we leave here. Si, sí, se puede. Yes, we can. So before we leave, though, um, there were many people who made this uh, day possible, not just this evening. We had an afternoon session as well. But the person who really just you know, steered this entire ship to harbor is um, Virginia Cumberbatch, the director of the UT Community Engagement Center. So I want to bring her up to say some closing words before we move into the reception. Thank you, Dr. Tang. It was actually a much bigger team um, than I. And I want 
to thank our panelists this evening, Senator Harris, the Honorable Julian Castro, and Dr. Kathleen McElroy. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your continuous work and strides in reconciling systemic issues of racism and social bias. I'd also like to thank Dr. Eric Tang um, for his leadership in making today's series of events possible and for his continuous work in the larger conversation around social justice. Um, my name is Virginia Cumberbatch, as Dr. Tang um, shared earlier, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Community Engagement Center Director here at the University of Texas, which is part of the larger Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. And similar to what Dr. Elroy was saying, um, that the mandate of the University of Texas and universities across our Central Texas area, including Houston Tillotson University, is the Community Engagement Center's mission is to leverage the resources of the university to address issues surrounding access and inequity in our community. And as our community and our country engage in important conversations around justice, civil liberties, human rights, racial reconciliation, race politics, these are not new, but they are ever critical conversations. They're mandates for attention, empathy, continued learning and understanding. And although we are decades removed from the Kerner Report or moments that we recognize as pivotal shifts in American history, like the suffrage movement, the March on Washington, the Immigration Act of 1965, or the Civil Rights Act of, Act of 1964, we cannot ignore or fail to recognize that these historic tragedies are still a part of our current realities. I encourage each of you to continue to seek out opportunities to build understanding, empathy, connection, and ultimately reconciliation of systemic prejudice and institutional racism. Tonight's conversations, none other like it, are not meaningful unless we create meaning outside of this building and in our everyday work. Martin Luther King Jr. said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step towards the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering, and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. We thank you for your presence this evening. I think your, your attendance is evident, at least of your interest, but we hope, hopefully, your dedication to such work. We invite you to join us for a reception in the back room uh, for some light reflections and conversations. Uh, before we do, I just want to thank our sponsors and our uh, cooperative organization. Um, and I also would like to give uh, recognition to a few folks. Um, I would like to acknowledge Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett, who's the president of Houston Tillotson University. She likes to remind us, and I think it's proper, that it's the oldest institution of higher learning here in Austin. Um, you heard from Nelson Linder, who's the president of the NAACP here in Austin. We have Ashton Cumberbatch, who um, is representing Mayor Adler's office and the, uh, the Task Force on Institutional Racism and Systemic Bias. And then we have Erica Sines and Dr. Suchi Guraj with uh, the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. Um, so thank you all for attending this evening. Again, I hope that you guys um, realize what a special moment this is, not just for, 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 for reflection, but intentional um, continued work. And so I ask that you join us in the back for some refreshments. And if you're leaving this evening, please be safe. And thank you so much. Thank you.